we're about to take a deep dive into some pretty fascinating life science concepts. Uh, the kind of stuff you'll need to know to ace that CSET. Multiple subjects, subtest two. And don't worry, we've got you covered. We'll be using top-notch test prep materials from teacherpreps.com so you can feel super confident going into that exam. That's right. We're going to unpack all those complex life science ideas and make sure you've got the knowledge you need to succeed. Okay, great. Let's start with the basics. The foundation of it all cells. You know those tiny building blocks that make up every single living thing on Earth? From the teeniest, tiniest bacteria to the tallest redwood tree? Amazing, right? It is. And what's even more mind-blowing is that some organisms can do it all with just one single cell. Can you believe that? Wow, so you're saying a single cell can be a whole organism all by itself. Exactly. And these single-celled organisms are like the ultimate survivors. They can thrive in the craziest environments you can imagine, like super hot boiling vents or freezing cold waters. You know why? Because their simplicity makes them so resilient. Huh. So it's like less is more in that case. They don't need all those complicated systems that we see in multi-celled organisms. Right. They've streamlined it down to the essentials. So how do we get from a single cell to a big, complex organism like a plant or an animal? Well, that's where multi-celled organisms come in. Their cells have learned to work together, specializing in different tasks. They form tissues, organs, and entire systems to get things done. So it's all about teamwork and specialization. Exactly. This division of labor allows for a lot more complexity and a wider range of functions. That makes a lot of sense. So we've got our single-celled organisms and our multi-celled organisms. Now, how do these organisms fuel themselves? How do they get the energy they need to survive and thrive? Well, it all starts with plants and this incredible process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. That's where plants use sunlight to make their own food, right? Exactly. It's like the ultimate life hack. Plants figured out how to capture light energy from the sun and convert it into chemical energy stored in the form of glucose. So they're like little solar panels turning sunlight into fuel. Exactly. And get this, this process doesn't just fuel the plant itself. It also releases oxygen as a byproduct. You know, the stuff we breathe. Wow. So yeah. plants are basically responsible for the air we breathe. That's incredible. It is. Photosynthesis is the basis of most food chains on Earth. It's what provides energy for almost all living things. Pretty amazing, huh? Totally. So where does this magical transformation take place? Where is the plant's solar panel located? Inside these amazing little structures called chloroplasts, they're found inside plant cells and they're packed with chlorophyll, the pigment that captures sunlight. Chlorophyll. That's what gives plants their green color, right? Exactly. And when sunlight hits the chlorophyll, in the chloroplast, that's when the magic happens. Okay, I'm all ears. Tell me about this magic. Well, there are two main stages to photosynthesis. First, you've got the light-dependent reactions. That's where light energy is used to split water molecules. And when those water molecules split, they release oxygen. You know that byproduct we were talking about. Right, so that's where the oxygen comes from. Exactly, but that's not all. The splitting of water molecules also creates energy carriers like ATP and NADPH. Think of them as tiny little rechargeable batteries storing the energy from the sunlight. So stage one is all about capturing and storing the energy from sunlight. Right. Then comes stage two, the Calvin cycle. Sometimes it's called the light independent reactions. And in this stage, the energy from those little batteries, the ATP and NADPH, is used to convert carbon dioxide from the air into glucose. So it's like a tiny factory using solar power to create the plant's food source. You got it. It's incredibly efficient and complex. Wow. Plants are way cooler than I thought. It's amazing how they've evolved this super intricate system for harnessing energy from the sun. I know, right? And this process is happening all around us in every leaf and blade of grass. It's mm. what keeps the planet running. It's what sustains life as we know it. Okay, so we've covered how plants make their own food. But what about us? What about all the other living things that can't just soak up sunlight and make glucose? Okay. How do we get the energy we need? Well, that's where cellular respiration comes in. Cellular respiration. Is that like breathing? It's related to breathing, but it's a lot more than that. It's the process that allows all living things, plants included, to convert the energy stored in glucose into usable energy for the cell. Wait, so you're saying plants do cellular respiration too? I thought they just did photosynthesis. They do both. It's actually how they access the energy they've stored in the glucose they make during photosynthesis. Cellular respiration is kind of like the universal energy converter for all living things. So this is happening in animals, fungi, bacteria, even plants. Precisely. It's the key to life as we know it. 
And the stars of this process are the mitochondria. Mitochondria, those are the powerhouses of the cell, right? Yeah, you got it. They're these little bean-shaped organelles with all those folds inside, remember? Yeah, from biology class. I always thought they looked kind of cool. They are pretty cool. And those folds, called cristae, increase their surface area, which means they can produce even more energy. So more folds equals more power. You got it. Now, cellular respiration is a multi-step process, but let's not get bogged down in the details. We'll just focus on the big picture. Essentially, you're breaking down glucose molecule by molecule and releasing energy that's used to create ATP, you know, the energy currency of the cell. Right. So it's like taking the energy from glucose and converting it into cash that the cell can use to pay for all its activities. Exactly. And this is happening constantly in every cell in your body right now, providing the energy you need to think, move, breathe, even just exist. Wow. I never really thought about it that way. It's mind blowing how these tiny processes are keeping us alive. It really is. And understanding these fundamentals like photosynthesis and cellular respiration helps us see the bigger picture. It helps us appreciate how interconnected all life on Earth really is. So true. Now I want to shift gears a bit and talk about how organisms grow and develop. They all go through these unique life cycles, some simple and some incredibly complex. Absolutely. Think about mice, for example. Yeah. Their offspring are born as many versions of their parents and they develop directly into adults. Pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, that makes sense. But then you have organisms like butterflies that go through this crazy metamorphosis. I know, right? From a crawling caterpillar to a winged beauty, it's one of the most fascinating transformations in nature. It's like magic. And frogs do it too, starting as tadpoles in the water before they hop onto land as adults. It really highlights the amazing adaptability of life and all the diverse ways organisms have figured out how to survive and reproduce. So we've got these different life cycles, but what about the actual ways organisms reproduce? How does that work? Well, there are two main types, sexual and asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is where you have the fusion of sperm and egg cells, and that increases genetic diversity, which is super important for adaptation and evolution. So offspring is a mix of traits from both parents. Exactly. That leads to a wider range of variations within a population. And that makes them more resilient to change. What about asexual reproduction? What's that all about? Asexual reproduction is like making clones offspring are genetically identical to the parent, which can be good in stable environments. So they're just spitting out copies of themselves? In a way, yeah. Think about plants that sprout new individuals from their roots or starfish that can regenerate from a single arm. Pretty wild, huh? That is wild. So there are benefits to both methods of reproduction. Absolutely. Each one has its own advantages depending on the organism and its environment. So we've covered how organisms reproduce and develop. But what about the factors that influence their growth? Like what kind of things can affect how an organism grows and matures? Well, there are a lot of external factors that can have a big impact. Light is crucial for plants, obviously, for photosynthesis, but it also plays a role in behaviors and those circadian rhythms in both plants and animals, you know, like our sleep-wake cycles. Right. And what about gravity? I know it keeps us grounded, but how does it affect other organisms? Well, for plants, gravity guides their growth, ensuring that roots go down and shoots go up. And it affects how organisms orient themselves in their environment. So they know which way is up, basically. I never thought about that. And what about stress? I know that can really mess with humans. Yeah. Does it affect other organisms too? Absolutely. Stress from things like lack of resources, predation, or changes in the environment can seriously impact an organism's development. And sometimes it can even lead to adaptations that help them cope with those challenges. So stress can actually drive evolution. In a way, yes. Organisms that can adapt to stress are less likely to survive and reproduce, while those with traits that help them cope are more likely to pass those traits on to their offspring. That's natural selection at work. Survival of the fittest. Okay, that makes sense. Now let's zoom back into the cellular level and talk about this thing called mitosis. It's the process of cell division that's crucial for growth repair and maintenance in multi-celled organisms. Yeah, I got it. Mitosis is how a single fertilized egg can develop into a complex organism with trillions of cells. Wow. So every time a cell divides, it has to make sure that each new daughter cell gets a complete copy of the organism's DNA. Uh, That's a lot of copying. I know, right? But mitosis is incredibly precise. It ensures that the genetic instructions are passed down accurately with every single cell division. That's amazing. And th th this process is essential for healing wounds too, right? Absolutely. Mitosis replaces damaged cells and keeps your tissues and organs functioning properly. It's a constant process of renewal happening all the time. Wow. So mitosis is like the ultimate repair crew keeping us in tip-top shape. Exactly. 
It's essential for life as we know it. Okay, so we've talked about how cells divide and how organisms grow and develop, but I want to talk about adaptations and evolution. It's incredible how organisms have developed these amazing features that help them survive in their specific environments. I know, right? It's mind-blowing. Think about a chameleon blending perfectly into its surroundings, or a dolphin's streamlined body perfectly designed for life in the water. These adaptations are the result of millions of years of evolution driven by natural selection. Natural selection. So the idea is that individuals with traits that make them better suited to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. Right, exactly. And they pass those advantageous traits onto their offspring. And over many generations, those traits become more common in the population. It's like nature is running a giant experiment, constantly testing different variations and selecting for the ones that work best. So it's all about survival of the fittest. And we have evidence for this, right? Terms of it. Fossil records show how life has changed over millions of years, and comparative anatomy reveals similarities between seemingly different species. We can actually see the connections and trace the evolutionary paths. That's so cool. It's like piecing together a giant puzzle. So that brings us to classification. 